Now hear this, now hear this. On this week's episode of Kirking Off, we check in on Captain Archer and his crew who find themselves plunged into a dangerous situation involving... The Borg? That's right. Likely to bump ratings, the showrunners decided to bring the Borg into the Enterprise series. But does it work? You'll have to judge for yourself, but some things to consider this week. If the Enterprise crew engaged the Borg in the time of Archer... Wouldn't there be a record in Starfleet somewhere? And does this not undermine the amazing next-gen episode, Q Who? Other important questions? Could Al Pacino play Spock? Would the Borg use deception and stealth as a weapon? And is there any practical use outside of opening your dinty more soup for the various Borg arm attachments? We present to you Regeneration from Star Trek Enterprise. Welcome to Kirking Off, a warped Star Trek shakedown with hosts Nathan and Dean. He got a fine tan shirt with an emblem on the chest. Nathan, we're going to do some retcon today. Yeah. I think we're going to retcon. Yeah, like, so look. It's interesting. Yeah. I... I saw some of the comments this week, and I thought Bry Cop had a pretty good one, and I want to talk a little bit about Bry Cop's comment. But, um, but I don't know, because I'm, I'm of two minds about this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that I definitely enjoyed this episode. Um, it was a cool watch, and uh, I had never seen it before. I'd never seen this episode, and uh, I think it's kind of cool to, take, to, to line the time periods up to do this thing where, you know, it, it could play out. Like... I guess, so I, structurally, I, I enjoy watching this episode and watching what's going on. Um, it definitely either, you could look at it as raising questions about the Borg and how they behave, or you can or you can look at it as learning a little bit more about the Borg. That, that's something maybe we didn't know. But as we continue our, what's becoming now a really massive Borg block, a Borg <laughs> cube, as it were, <laughs> I, I, I ask myself, um, you know, is the situation that we have, because I think we don't want to bury the lead here, is the situation that we have, is this information, is this encounter something that shouldn't have been unknown to Picard? Yes, that is the ultimate question. That's the ultimate question, right? And I think, unfortunately, the amount of kind of detail they go into and the amount of con- contact they actually have means it probably should have. Yeah, it would have been. And they don't even give us any lines of dialogue saying like, oh, you know, we're going to, we're going to sit on this, you know, we're going to probably smart. Seat. Yeah. You would have assumed like maybe, but give me a little denouement at the very end where, you know, Admiral Forrester there is like, Oh, we're going to, you know, th- we can't talk to anyone about this, you know, mm-hmm. you know, w- wait for further instructions or something like that. It would raise questions as to why. Yeah. Unless you had like, you know, Admiral Forrester's hanging out and then, you know, a Starfleet yeah. Intel agent comes in and says, Hey, <laughs> keep this under wraps. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's um I like how they tied it back to Cochran. Mm-hmm. I like how we address the realization that Cochran is not somebody who would probably keep his mouth shut about the encounter. <laughs> exactly. Because why would anybody? Yeah. Especially someone prone to drinking and mm-hmm. <laughs> and and talking. Mm. We, that's the character we saw in first contact. Right. He is going to let it slip. And in, it, in another thing Nate, and I thought about this too. Do you remember when I said well, wouldn't the Vulcans have spotted something amiss, like, you know, an enterprise in orbit of the planet they were making first contact with? Yeah. Because there's no situation in first contact where they go, okay, we're going to, we, we need to hide the enterprise. The Vulcans are coming. Yeah. It, sh- it, it may be, maybe if I'm being more generous, I say, well, let's assume they did that because they're not dumb and they went on the other side of the planet. But I don't know because maybe, maybe they just didn't give a fuck at that point. But here's what I will say. Nobody believed Cochran that people came from the future and that these things were here and it was all kind of swept under the rug. Yeah. Okay. But- And he himself recanted, according to the- He did recant. So my question becomes, what are the Vulcans doing? Because let's assume the Vulcans know that something went on. But maybe they don't. Maybe they, maybe they, when they met Riker and the rest of the crew in first contact, maybe they just assumed they were part of the local populace and maybe the Enterprise was hidden. That's the best way to explain it. Otherwise, you have to assume they saw the Enterprise with their technology. Yeah. They yeah. picked it up. They're like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Well, and Hail so, it. yeah, we have a situation too where right before, essentially, they're going to have that first contact. Not only is the Enterprise still very much 
in orbit of Earth, mm. uh, they have launched all of their lifeboats. This is a good point. You know, uh, their escape pods. So there's literally, what, like 60, 70? Lots of satellites yeah, in orbit. <laughs> and 60 or 70 lifeboats that have come to Earth. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that they're landing. Yeah. Uh, all over planet Earth. They have to collect all those. They have to, you know. Instead, we get this, oh, well, we we can recreate the Borg effect, and we're going to go back to our proper time now. And it's like, okay, well, you did clean up after yourselves. And right. one of the things that you would think that they would be aware of, and even more than perhaps an abandoned Federation life pod or escape pod, uh, would be the remains of the Borg ship that they right. blew up. Right, absolutely. And uh, we see clearly they didn't care much for what happened to that because we now see what happened. It somehow ended up all in the Arctic and there's somehow like, you know, tangible pieces mm-hmm. that are of sizable, you know, nature and, and some Borg themselves. Indeed. Can I do something, Nathan? Sure. I want to clarify a statement I made because I got into a little Facebook discussion with some <laughs> of our fine listeners and it, and it allowed me to, to crystallize my thoughts around one of my issues with first contact, which is the episode we just did. And I'm going to go back in time. Let me warp a second. All right. <laughs> we're, we're zooming back in time real quick. Here's what I want to just clarify on that, because I think I had some people confused, including myself. Here's the problem with first contact. And a lot of the other stuff you can just hand wave, and I have no problem with it. It's the fact that the population, 9 billion, all Borg people are going, Jesus fucking Christ, this again. <laughs> doesn't make sense because Picard says we have to follow them back and fix the damage that's been done. Mm -hmm. It should have been, we have to follow them back and prevent the damage from being done that we think is going to be done. You have to take that whole 9 billion thing out because it doesn't make any sense that when the enterprise arrives, there's not 9 billion Borg on the planet earth. Yeah. It doesn't not, that doesn't make any sense at all. You could just, if, if you take that line out, it's not a problem. The movie is perfectly fine if they follow the Borg cube back, the Borg sphere back in time, and it's laying waste to the Phoenix. And you go, fuck, stop that. Don't let them fuck up the timeline. But to say, oh my God, the population's all Borg, and then suddenly it isn't, doesn't make any sense when you follow them through the warp tunnel. Yeah, what they're basically saying is that the 2263 Earth is all Borg. So something, when the Borg sphere is going back, does that. But so... The Enterprise gets this glimpse of an all Borg Earth, and the question is, why on Earth would they do that? Because they're clearly immune to the time shift, as they are Correct. In, in the temporal wake and everything. So you know they're fo- and they're following the sphere in. Yep, it's like that. Just that whole part doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there's no situation in which there. The Here's Borg how it makes sphere sense. Isn't stopped. Here's how it makes sense. The Borg sphere goes through, and then you go. Well, that wouldn't even make sense no, either. Exactly. Because you would have been, <laughs> yeah. you would be gone. You'd be the gone. The Enterprise would be gone. Yeah. So you either are gone or the, there is population. So yeah, it doesn't work. If you go through, if you go through with them and you see all Borg, then you go, oh, how do we fix this? Yeah. That could have been the movie. Yeah. Instead of the Cochrane no. stuff. Yeah. But I think you just got to take that out of it. I think they're just trying to somehow up the stakes a little. That's exactly it. I think that's yeah. all it was, but it was not, it was not well thought out as no. far as I can tell. No. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's it. That's all. I, I just wanted to clarify because that was, it's not, it doesn't, it should have just been taken out of the fucking script. Yeah. There's we, a t- similar original series episode, uh, actually a very good one, uh, uh, City on the Edge of Forever. Sure. Where uh, Bones accidentally goes back in time and changes everything. Uh, and the Enterprise is somehow immune, but mm-hmm. they are still in the present. Okay. You know what I mean? So, so the they see everything change. Yeah, the Federation is gone. They can't reach out to anybody. Yep. They're a ship alone, essentially. Yep. And uh, and so that makes sense because they also then can go back in time and fix it. Correct. Uh, and, you know, this, you, there's no, I mean, you could have tried to do something like that. Mm-hmm. Like maybe have the the temporal door still be open or something and they're just could chilling on the other side and suddenly Earth changes. But then, how do you not explain that, oh, suddenly Earth changes? Not only are there 9 billion Borgs, there'd be Borg cubes floating everywhere, and the Enterprise is instantly destroyed. Correct. <laughs> Correct, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, and the Enterprise never would have gotten there. It, it has to be immune. There. It has to be immune, yeah. In some way, and, and so, yeah. Right. Temporal right. shenanigans. Temporal shenanigans. Yeah. But yeah, it is, it is a bit confusing, because... Yeah. And it's just unnecessary. Right, right. We have to... Up the stakes. 
you know, up to six. Everything's got to be amplified because mm-hmm. it's a movie. Because it's a movie. Yeah. But okay, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that because I because I thought about it again, and, and when you sometimes when you're podcasting, you're talking off the cuff, and something comes up, it can be difficult to convalesce your thoughts around something. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, after writing it down, I was like, okay, this is kind of how I wanted to say this. So there you have it. Anyway. So on that fancy soundboard of yours, yeah, can we get a version of like the Borg are back in town? The <laughs> Borg are back in town. Yeah, we we might be able to come up with something. We'll have to whip something up. Yeah, we talked about this last time, didn't we? Uh, way back when. Uh, I think we did Q Who, and then I think we talked about the Borg are back in town. This is true. Best of both worlds. Well, if there's one thing I know about the Borg, resistance is futile. <laughs> I know they're always saying that. Blah blah blah, blah, blah. and yet they never win. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess resistance ain't so futile now, is it, bitches? <laughs> resistance is <sighs> futile? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> Assimilation is futile. It's too deep. funny. But yeah. Too funny. So we uh, have, you know, that, that is the thing I think a lot of people have problems with this episode is the the ability to kind of pick holes and, and discover a lot of kind of continuity errors. Yeah, the biggest being... That if the Enterprise under the command of Archer had an encounter with this Borg grouping, regardless of whether or not they call them the Borg, which they never do, which I kind of dig, mm-hmm. is how is this not available to Picard? How is it not an incident Picard would be schooled in? Yeah. Yeah. And or, or, a starship or the data doesn't instantly have some kind of record. At, at the worst. Yeah. Yeah. At the worst. Data would know. Yeah. And I do like when they talk about Zephyr Cochran having told the tale at a during a commencement address. That's that's Princeton, a Cochran move, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, this and- thing on. Ooh. <laughs> Listen up, everybody! <laughs> I'm six foot seven, and I'm into crazy conspiracies. Okay, the moon landing was fake. You know, I know because that little kid Danny stood up and he had the Apollo T-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> or sweater, whatever the fuck. Sweater, yeah, yeah. Yep. And Stanley Kubrick is a CIA psyop. And uh, what else? Uh, oh yeah, guys came from the future. Oh Jesus! Somebody play them off. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, time travel is very possible. I know this. The DNC has been infected by lizard people. <laughs> I've seen time the, traveling lizard people. I've seen the documents, Nathan. I've heard the tapes. Have been declassified. I, I, you you got to do uh, it. Uh, Alex Jones is great and all, but I want to hear Jesse Ventura. <laughs> I can't do it. Oh, you can't. I, I was a Navy SEAL. That's pretty good. That's all, that's all I know about him. Just, I would punch Kyle Reese. Was it not Kyle Reese? <laughs> <laughs> if I were the Terminator. Kyle Reese, you fucking idiot. <laughs> What's his name? Uh, the yeah, American, the American sniper, sniper guy. Chris Kyle. Chris Kyle. Oh, fuck. Yeah. But yeah, so... Uh, I, if you were somebody else, I'd sock you in the nose. I was a Navy SEAL. Before they were even called, I was in Da Nang with the underwater dive team. Now I'm off the grid. <laughs> I put Charlie in a torture rack and pinned him in three seconds. The novelty of my governorship <laughs> wore off even faster than Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm off the grid. Actually, no, I don't know if that's true. I think he survived as governor pretty well mm-hmm. for a while. It was after his governorship. My arms were bigger than Arnold's. <laughs> of co- exactly. Of course, that's what he thought, because I had to measure them smaller to trick him. And he getting duped by an Austrian who can't even speak English. <laughs> but yeah, so... Uh, of course. We have uh, a... Federation science team. Mm. Now, so this is one of my first problems with this episode. Could you imagine (laughs) something that would be bigger, of bigger scientific importance and of general importance than the discovery of an alien craft crash land in the Arctic? And remember, this is Is only- Is it Antarctica? Antarctica? uh, I, I think it's the Arctic. You're right, it is. And so why are there just a couple dudes- and a couple, you know, like things with this woman's name, yeah. Rooney. Rooney, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I think that lady's. Uh, I think that's. Uh, uh, I think that's the doctor's wife in real life. Yeah, yeah. That woman is is Flox's wife in real life. Really, Rooney, <laughs> you're married to an alien. <laughs> uh, the noblian. <laughs> nine times. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. Like, it's, uh, why are they wearing? Oh, I want to smack them. They're wearing like uh, overalls. Yeah. Well, no, they're like snow pants. <laughs> snow pants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like little kid snow pants. Do 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 do. And uh, and so yeah, it just seems to me like this would have been given a lot more attention mm. by the Federation, or not even by the, obviously the Federation doesn't exist right now. By Starfleet and by uh, humanity generally. Yeah, it's funny that Starfleet exists before the Federation, but yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So you have a great amount of this metal and everything left over from the Borg cube. They reached out to Starfleet, right? Yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, well, Starfleet was apprised of the situation. They knew of what was going on. They mm. knew what this team had found in it, and it, you know, they found corpses of aliens, and there just seems to be a lack of interest. Not or not even. A lack of excitement, mm-hmm. really. Yeah, I, I, I put it, it seems down. seems unrealistic to me. Do you know what, you know what I call it? Bad acting. <laughs> it just might just not be great acting. And I get it, you know? You're banging the doctor so you get a role. <laughs> but, but. Well, but so I'm, I'm just thinking, like, uh, if it had been a much smaller, like <clears throat> a few pieces of debris, and, you know, maybe you don't even do a full board, because it makes it's kind of nonsense that they survived the... Uh, quantum torpedoes of the enterprise e and then also <laughs> also falling through atmosphere uh to be in such great shape that they can revive themselves where are their parachutes maybe they must have they must have had nano parachutes is there no is there no craft yeah i guess there's debris yeah there's debris so maybe so, they had a little skate that did borg out escape pods uh, you know they could have made it a borg escape pod and that would have been a little more realistic could have been and, and i say realistic we're of course talking about yeah, what are you going to do? But, or it could have been better explained. And then more importantly, if there isn't this vast quantity of stuff that they're finding, it becomes more sensible that there's no real record. of it. You know what I like, though? I like a nice research facility in the snow. Yeah. I like a nice little homage to the thing. We got yes. these people who... Don't... You just know they're doomed. You're fucked. Yeah. You can't run around outside too much. You got these people inside. You don't know what's going on. Um, yeah, there seems to be a lack of excitement. I'll chalk that up to the acting, but there also seems to be a lack of concern about having alien corpses that you're not sure yes. what they are and they're riddled with cybernetics. Yeah. I, I would expect a and little bit more. And you've discovered active nano and yeah. nanites or whatever. Yeah. They, you, he, he realizes there are yeah. nanobots moving around. Repairing. Literally healing it. Yes. Yeah. And there's the, uh, there's the scene where, uh, you know, the, that medical guy it seems anyway is talking to you know the other scientist or whatever and, and the other, he's like well if we refreeze the bodies isn't there a chance that would hurt them and the guy's like i don't know i guess maybe mm-hmm. and it's, it seems like it's a very slight chance whereas there's a so okay maybe you lose some amount of data or whatever but you're letting them come back to life that's yeah. what he's doing yep like intentionally, he's letting them mm-hmm. regenerate, and I don't know whether yeah. he thinks that they're going to be friendly or whatever. They look awfully friendly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they <laughs> look like bouncers at a Rammstein show, and they're different species, both, mm-hmm. uh, which is interesting. <clears throat> yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah, although I do wish they had uh, like made one more obviously like Klingon or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. What what it, what was that near human? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's a near human, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, we have the situation where we watching it know how serious their peril is and they do not. And they do not. And, and they, you know, die. <laughs> Horrible death. <laughs> and F- Admiral Forrester is a, a prize of the city. Yes. Admiral, there's a problem with the A6 excavation team. Science Council hasn't heard from them in three days. How, how is this possible? Well, sir, they dug up aliens, allowed them to regenerate, and did not protect, did not, did not, and no security measures were taken. Yeah. Ah, new to cipher from orbit, only yeah. way to be sure. And they're on Earth, so it's not like communications is an issue, you know? It's it's a little bizarre. Hmm. Get a shuttle ready. <laughs> we'll go give the more people to turn into drones. <laughs> there you go. Um, there is one thing about this episode that is outstanding, and it's the music. Music, yes. It was Utterly impressive. Yeah. Um, there's quite a few moments of it, and uh, we'll let it play uh, in a minute here when we get to it. But but I don't know, man. You know, there might be some silliness going on, and, you know, maybe this research station isn't expecting to pull aliens. Maybe they don't know how to, maybe they don't know the right protocol when they do. Yeah. 
but uh, and that's obvious. But yeah. uh, but I do <laughs> like this idea of a research station that's yeah. about to be overrun because you've pulled something out of the ice. Yes, I love the premise of this, and I think it could have been well done. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, actually, I shouldn't say that. it is well done. Mm-hmm. It is an enjoyable episode. Yep. But, Outside of continuity errors, yeah. there's not a lot about here that's egregiously annoying to me. Yeah. Just a couple things. And so you give them a couple lines saying like, "Oh, uh, you know, we know first of all that they've stolen this transport." And they're modifying it and they're borgifying it <laughs> and they're giving it, you know, new weapons and stuff it didn't have. This is a transport that could only normally do 1.4 warp. Yep. And they're, they first start tracking it at doing warp three point something. Three nine. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, okay. Give me a line about how they took all of the computers and material from the research station mm-hmm. and all of the data from the research station. So suddenly we have a reason why maybe they weren't backing up to the cloud. And now we know why we don't have any of that information yet from the board uh, in the future. Uh, and then, you know, when obviously the enterprise has to destroy the transport, so you can't get any information there. Yeah. Uh, and then, so that leaves what might potentially be the biggest misstep, I think from a continuity point of view uh, is the, when, you know, the, the transport finds a, uh, a, another vessel, a, a Tarkalian ship. Mentioned in past prologue. Yep. And they assimilate the whole crew and okay, great. But two of the crew are left behind, still infected with the nanoprobes. Enterprise takes them in and one of them gets the doctor. Mm. That's what I, do you think one, was that necessary? And two, what does that mean? Because now suddenly we have uh, a well-published medical expert uh, having this experience having access to these nanites he's taken all the the measurements and everything like that he's studied them he's sampled them that is what to me is there's no they don't get rid of that information at all you know that is all right this is in other words this this stuff with dr flox is is really what i mean i would have passed on to the next gen era yeah i mean you had an engagement with these things they were in your ship this has to be, this would, we, we would, we would call this in Starfleet. If you ever liked the Starfleet RPG game, this is, there's a threat assessment here that would have yes. to happen. There's there a threat assessment that, that this, that you'd be briefed on. In the second Q said, he, it's the ultimate user. He's like, yes, right yeah. now I've read the fucking report. <laughs> yeah. Data's like, chime again. Not like, so omnipotent are you now? He's like, damn you. Gets mad. Send him <laughs> to some new thing that they'll retcon in the next series. Yeah. But no, I think you're right. I think so. So it's interesting because the question becomes, how much do we care? I know some viewers will care more than others um, because it's clearly there's just no way with the way information worked in Starfleet, the way it it, it works in this, even in this century, they have warp technology. They've been established. They have a Starfleet. They have a weapons officer. They're, they're a legitimate, they're a legitimate force. Yeah. This would have been cataloged. This would have been studied because of all because of the yeah. infiltration of the enterprise yeah. this yeah. would have been known another ship with the same fucking name at the minimum even if the ship was named the fucking valley forge it would still be yeah studied but the fact that you have a ship named enterprise the first thing you do when when you get flung into the future is you go have we ever encountered this before yeah you know in 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 is that jjr q yeah or, uh, or q who no q who yeah it's, in q who it's like you 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 definitely undermine Q Who with this episode, even though I am understanding that this episode is quite popular at the time. Mm-hmm. It got pretty damn good ratings. People seem to really like it mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. Yeah. Because it is really cool, unless you're a fucking nerd and you're going, well, in first content, this doesn't make sense in nine billion and fucking Well, but so this is always and this is always kind of my problem with a lot of, you know, prequel stuff or even sequel stuff written by folks who aren't that well versed and i feel like that's where a lot of the newer track has gone <laughs> did i saw that a mile away yeah well but I, i'm not even gonna break into <laughs> so many diatribes. Or sequels where they don't understand where they the have material. clearly not watched a fucking episode jesus christ of the so goddamn show alert. that they're supposedly a sequel of go to tactical alert <laughs> It's going to tactical alert. <laughs> give me, give me the photon torpedo. Firing. I don't have it yet. It'll be on the next update. But uh, so, and uh, in this instance too, we have Flocks, who is not 
uh, well, or if not officially Starfleet anyway, he's right. of an entire different culture and everything that are these known. Zenoblian. Yes. And they're known medical experts and everything. He talks about publishing data. He talks about corresponding with all his doctor friends and everything. You think these nanites aren't going to be a popular kind of topic of, of, of course, discussion? And of stuff? course. And, and these, that, that these people, the, the Tarkalians, the humans, the, they were get they got t- taken over and completely controlled by them. Mm-hmm. That all of that is making it into a lot of material. And mm-hmm. this is, you know, one, because of its connection to earth itself and everything, this is going to be big news back home. So it's going to be, you know, I'm assuring that I'm assuming rather that there's a good number of nerds in this time frame, 2163 or whatever, who are waiting for each kind of report from the enterprise right. as it travels amongst the stars, right, this right, right. first warp five vessel for humanity. Yeah, it's like, man. yeah, that's a big deal. It had to destroy the, uh, a human science team that had been taken over by robots. Mm-hmm. That's making it somewhere. That's showing up somewhere in 200 years. Yeah. In the future. You know, there was this, yeah, of course there was this incident where robots took over other people. That's not a common thing. No. And, and, but so, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt and thinking, you know, obviously there's a lot of information that gets produced in the next 200 years. Uh, so maybe this somehow gets lost in the fray and data's not aware of it <laughs> when they meet the Borg. Right. But the only, that's very possible that they didn't think it's possible that they were, that they didn't have the, the, the novelty of research amidst mm-hmm a fucking situation where they felt threatened in that moment. But even then they had moments to reflect and to assemble in the ward room yeah. or yeah. the observation lounge. I think yeah. they call or it. Or then like when you're, by the time you're at best of both worlds, I, that's, that's someone has that's uncovered this connection. Once you're out of that episode and you're into future Borg episodes and TNG, like best of both worlds, you can't tell me it's not something, you know, that, that Shelby's Shelby's research is not just going to be the encounter from Deja Q. Yeah. No, it can't. Q-hoo, excuse me. Yeah. I keep doing that. It's going to be the information from regeneration. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so obviously, you know, it, they wanted to connect to the you know, success of Next Gen. First right? Contact. And and the success of the movie. That's what this is. Yeah. yeah, right. And so, yeah, this is almost a direct sequel. And I like it for a lot of reasons. I love the horror movie feel in the beginning. Absolutely. It's very, it's very cool. It's very much uh, it, as its own. If you take it, the problem with Star Trek is it's tough to take it out of the context yes. of the greater intellectual that property. But if you do, in my opinion, you got a pretty solid fucking episode. Yeah. Even. Why? Because we have no history of the Borg and we don't know how they operate. So we don't have to question things like how do the nanites infect people? Yeah. It's interesting that they have different time periods. It's kind of interesting that the Noblians seem difficult, more difficult to assimilate, but, yeah. but would be, yeah, but would be and not, a, not not a long period of time that the fact that a doctor thought of a radical treatment for himself, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. But, well, um, and so I, I, the one thing I would add there is so a lot of people are like, Oh my God, you know, what do you mean? He cared assimilation back then. And it's like, no, I, I, give me a line of dialogue saying, well, one of the reasons this works is because the are one of the few species that the Omega radiation or made up doesn't fuck them up. Doesn't fuck them up as much. Mm-hmm. Like this would be a, Fatal dose for humans. Yeah, this is this is fucking Chernobyl ground zero. And but kind of but the Noblian physiology is mm-hmm. a little bit different, and so there's a chance he's going to survive. Did, and did, he gets fucked up too. Can you remind me? W- is there been a precedent set where Borg have trouble with this type of radiation? I don't know. Okay, I because my all of so what is interesting about Enterprise and regeneration in particular is not only are we talking, of course, first contact and all the next gen stuff. This is post a lot of those Voyager episodes, right. if not all of them. which a lot of our listeners are screaming at us to watch. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, that's what we, we will probably end the Borg arc with it's a good call, uh, a Voyager app or a two parter Voyager. App. This is a scorpion. What's it called? Scorpion is, is the one. Cause it also introduces the, uh, species eight four seven two, right. which is an interesting thing in and of itself. Fluidic space, man. <laughs> yeah, fucking sick. And man. it's our introduction, uh, introduction, <laughs> introduction to seven of nine, mm. which you know we haven't done any episodes that have seven of nine in them yet. It's true. Uh, so hmm. so we haven't been able to make any of the the very lewd nerd <laughs> six of nine jokes or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, so. Give me some reason why, in particular, this works for flocks, but might not work for human beings. Uh, and that works, you know, as far as like, 
you know, cure for assimilation. Mm. Uh, but basically, uh, what I'm saying is you could have also, I think it would have been, you could have done a more emotionally impactful episode by having it just be a random crew member and they can't save it. Mm. They have to destroy the nanoprobes with this radiation. <laughs> mean, just, they have to fucking kill it. <laughs> they just microwave it and send it to death. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Resistance is futile. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Apparently. Stick them in the microwave. <laughs> I was going to say, just don't microwave us. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> it hurts. It <laughs> fucking hurts. <laughs> it just fucking melts them like, god damn Or that's... something like that to stave off the, you know, him turning into a drone and affecting other people. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with the with the complaints. Like, oh, they just cured no. assimilation because that assumes you have, can render treatment. Yes. When they attack no, you, you yeah. don't have time. And, you can, and I do think that there's something to be said that we are seeing the Borg at their weakest we've ever seen them. Yeah. You know, Coming this, out of an ice block, <laughs> like a fucking yeah. caveman. Just barely regenerated. They're <laughs> cobbling together shit on the fly. That's it. <laughs> and uh, such that they actually are outclassed legitimately by, you know, a prototype enterprise at X01. You know, uh, yeah. Experimental because, Warp 5 vessel. Uh, I see that was a good writing move to have yeah. them commandeership that their nanites are then reprogramming and making better. Yeah. Still not going to be good enough just yet. It's not, no. if it was a cube, the enterprise would be fucked. fucked. Yeah. Beyond or, or a sphere. It'd be yeah. fucked. Any, any bo- actual Borg ship. It'd be yeah. Fucked. Yeah. And so I like that, that, and in a way they're almost fucked. Uh, cause as you can see, they, they're talking about how the, the, the speed of the ship is increasing. Mm. And they pretty much caught them at the last possible time frame, right? Because they were going to proceed at a speed that the Enterprise couldn't keep up, and then for sure they're gone. You know, yeah. Uh, although, so here's my question: uh, Borg tactics. Mm. Uh, I feel like they don't have any, <laughs> and that's a problem. <laughs> And maybe it's because they're we didn't say we're going to add your tactical distinctiveness to our own. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only well, maybe if... that's why they needed Lacunas. I mean, that makes sense now a, a <laughs> bit more because uh, the, you know the whole you know beaming over and they don't instantly jump on you. Although they they go after uh, Reed and uh, Archer pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and they move quick. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but they should be basically just trying to assimilate everybody they can. Yeah, are you talking about they, when they're down in sick bay? Yes, or the uh, infirmary. I don't yeah, know exactly. They don't take time. They should. They should plant their seeds. They, you know, they hit flocks because he's literally standing over them mm-hmm. when they suddenly kind of wake up out of sedation. But they don't kill the security guard, or, or they don't infect the security guard, uh, and they don't even when they're fighting uh, Reed's team. One of the the red shirts, you know, is about to get tubule. The tubules are out. They're going mm-hmm. for his neck, and Reed just hits. The board cracks with, him in the head. Hits him with a, the butt of like a, a rifle, and it's like, oh, that's all it takes. Yeah. Why? Why do we ever try to shoot these things? Let's just scrap with them. You know, Go hand to hand. Yeah, you yeah. can literally punch them out. Or you know, worse comes to worse, we see what you do. You just you disconnect their coaxial cables, <laughs> and they die. It's incredible. <laughs> that's that's got to be a glaring weakness. You know. Yeah, yeah. You can't have an exposed. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have an exposed tube. That's. Sh- that's the whole fucking thing. Though. It disconnects them from the Wi-Fi, yeah. and suddenly oh, they're fuck. done. I was mid-download. <laughs> now I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'll just lay here on the floor. <laughs> Pornhub is not responding. <laughs> fuck. No, I don't want to get up. <laughs> That's too funny. But yeah, so uh, the the my question is: Would a better Borg tactic have been take that little ship, go to a major city, and just start assimilating? Yeah. They could have killed all of Earth, but instead they tried to run away or whatever and contact the Delta Quadrant. So what do you think? Do you think, so So I have a question for you, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit. So the Borg are not attacked to the Collective right now. Yeah, I don't think they could be. So if they are not attached to the Collective, what is directing their behavior and what are they supposed to do? So when Hugh is disconnected, I guess until he got, psychologized into having a cute little name that he probably would have attempted to assimilate people and just keep, I guess, yeah. I, I guess that's the Borg tech is if you separate them, they're going to continue to try to assimilate, mm-hmm. but they're you not getting, if they're detached from the collective, it becomes a problem. Yeah. And, and perhaps that's why there seems to be a bit more of a robotic 
flair to these Borg, which is mm. kind of almost a return to previous iterations, mm. uh, and not a, like kind of an active type of response. Because yeah, maybe the, their collective is in the beginning anyway, just those two drones. Mm, right. I, I can't imagine that's much brain power there. Yeah. But Chip gets wild in the fucking sick bay. Yeah. I'm going to sedate him. Are you? <laughs> you're going to what? I'm going to sedate him. Are you sure? Because I think you're going to I'm going to be assimilated. <laughs> you're going to get stabbed in the neck and tossed over the table like a fucking rag doll. Um, so I have a question for you. Have you ever seen the Borg move so fast? No. Well, hand to hand's one thing, but then they actually move quickly. Like, there seems to be, there's this moment in the Borg, uh, in the, in the uh, infirmary, where we learn he's... I'm going to sedate him. Right. <laughs> and as he does, if you watch carefully this scene, he's like, I'm trying to treat you. I'm going to sedate you. And you can watch the the woman, Borg. She's actually being deceptive. Yeah. She's moving slowly and she's attempting to sneak. So this I found. And then it's, it's an explosive action. Correct. To I, I found this very, um, very not atypical of Borg tactics. So my question becomes, is this person acting with some sort of free will whose DNA is being reprogrammed by these nanites to do what they're supposed to do, but still maintains enough of a free will to know like, oh, I need to sneak here. Do you know what I mean? Like, Borg never sneak. No. And you could tell she's trying to delay her attack into where she can make a move on this being timed, essentially, with the the, the other Borg's assault on it. As we know, timing is utterly irrelevant to the Borg. The second they they decide... The second that threat become hits a threshold, they act. But I also wonder how much of that is the fact that the Borg, in every other episode we see them, can throw basically unlimited force at something. Yeah, strength. I don't have any problem with her strength No, here. and they don't have to care it's about- It's deception I'm the, curious the, about. Well, but I think they almost have no choice at this point. You know what I mean? But also, I think it's a good example of, we see these two drones- but they don't really look like drones at the moment. They just mm. have some metal bits sticking out of their face or whatever. And they move fast. They, yeah. they briskly Although walk. Although with like the, a kind of a robotic which is arm why, swing and stuff. W- which is why I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards they are, they, are, they are acting as Borg, but they're not quite Borg yet. Yeah. And as a result of that, they are acting in a more deceptive fashion. They are moving with a little more alacrity. Mm-hmm. They're not just plodly. Well, stomping around. What do you think about the fact that I'm pretty sure that, you know, the Borg, as we know them, as all their cybernetic bits, my suspicion is that hampers movement <laughs> and stealth. Sure. So, uh, do I you think, think, in other words, as soon saying, as that lady gets her can opener arm, <laughs> she's done with her deception. If you got some dinty more beef stew, <laughs> Dude, you're all set. She got I mean, open she's going to help you. you. Fucking show up in SpaghettiOs so fast your head will spin. <laughs> yep. And then she'll hit you with the nano probes. Eventually. You're, done. Eventually. You're, done. Yeah. You're just a little slow. But you'll enjoy those SpaghettiOs. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah. yeah. And then when she clubs you in the head, your SpaghettiOs will be all over the <laughs> fucking infirmary. <laughs> your SpaghettiOs brains. Yuck. Oh, Ooh, boy. Hmm. But yeah. But I like. So Fox. maybe. Maybe you're onto something. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe they. Maybe if they weren't so festooned with cybernetics <laughs> that they would be a little more flight of foot you know with their uh, achilles heel tubes on their foreheads <laughs> fucking coaxial cables are a bitch you know and, and you know while that phaser rifle shooting out you know the hundreds of megajoules of energy or whatever it is yeah it's gonna bounce off them but when you turn that around and hit him in the face with the butt of that rifle, they're going down, man. They're going down. <laughs> My gun has the power of the sun in it. <laughs> or I can hit you with the butt of the rifle. Ah. Uh, and you're prepared for one, but not for the other. Which do you think is, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what you shouldn't do? I'm going to sedate him. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> no. You're going to get your ass kicked, Flox. You're real smart. Really cool. I really yep. like Flox. I like Flox. Yep. And then he just gets thrown around. Oh. But yeah, they they look creepy, man. This girl looks wild. Yeah, yeah. The I like the uh, uh, Tarkarians. Yeah, whatever. Although their ship is very uninspired, <laughs> it's just a block <laughs> of nonsense. <laughs> yeah, what are they called? Uh, da, 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 da. Let me scroll through here, pal. They're called. I don't. How are Tarkalians, none of, I'm they, sure. Yeah, it's yeah. called a Tarkalian freighter. Yeah. The Tarkalians. 
Ja, 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 ja. Ja, 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 ja. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, so uh, what I think too, so we've talked all about the the connections to first contact, and there's there's a lot, and I like that. I like a lot of the you know doing things like that, but I think you could cut about half. I think it does just become a bit much. The connections, too. yeah, yeah, like you know, have the Zephyr Cochran bit, and and that's important. Mm-hmm. But then you know you don't necessarily need. I don't know. Like I'm trying to think of some of the other little ones. Uh, maybe maybe Zephyr maybe the Zephyr one doesn't have to be. In there. No, that's true too. Maybe he would have been briefed to like not say anything about like. I think it's funny because like they make Zeph from Cochran out to be some piss pants, but he's like this brilliant fucking guy. Hey, some of the most brilliant guys are piss pants. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> no, absolutely. But Zeph from strikes me as the kind of guy that would have been pulled aside by Riker and he would have just said, listen, keep this on the QT, buddy. But also a guy who was drunk may be popped off. Well, I think that's what Riker probably would have said. He would have said, look, there's this thing called AA. I'm going to have you go to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should really go to these meetings, Ephraim. And, you know, maybe he turns his life around. Yeah, it's possible. Yep, yeah, it's very possible. But, um, but I don't know. It's, uh, okay. I couldn't, I, I don't know all the connections. They're not ringing. No, about. yeah, they're not ringing. But here's what but, I do want to talk about. Um, well, oh, for instance, like the whole, oh, they're sending the, you know, the uh, signal into the Delta Quadrant. And, oh, you know, we might see uh, an assault force in 200 years. Okay. And it's like, uh, you don't have to draw that connection. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff like that. Just Mm. like little kind of homages. Oh, it's a perfectly spherical vessel and blah, blah, blah. And all of that stuff would be appearing in reports. You know what I mean? And and that, so the less of that, the better kind of thing. Right. Um, Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. There comes a point where these two Tarkalians, are they? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, get vented into space fucking BSG style <laughs> yeah. because Archer uh, realizes where they are on the ship, knows the ship well enough to vent them into space, yeah. thus eliminating them as a threat. And it becomes a bit of a moral dilemma. Let's have a listen. The junction's empty. The junction's Close the hatch and repressurize. Malcolm, I want you to work with Trip. Find out what they were doing in there. Aye, sir. Resume course and speed. You had no choice. So, how do you feel about this? Well, uh, it's actually, I think, low-key my favorite part of the episode. Not that specifically, but I have in my notes, Archer it's coming of age. <laughs> and and it really, I do feel like this is kind of part of his story arc because, you know, we have a very idealistic Archer yep. who, you know, has that hero's mentality of we're going to save everyone. Hmm. And, you know, and that's not going to be the case a lot of times. And I do feel like he struggles with that in this episode, but accepts it. Seal all of them. Yeah. Fucking Colonel Ty. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And so I, I feel like that it is a great moment for him. And Scott Bakula plays it really well. You know, in his facial expressions and everything. I mean, he, at the end, not only did he have to vent out these two helpless aliens, you know, that had been taken over, but they were themselves innocent. They were mm-hmm. just freighter work. They're victims. Yeah. Uh, and, and then at the end, you know, he's firing upon the transport that he knows to be filled with formerly human beings, a whole science team, mm-hmm. you know, and the rest of the Tarkalian freighter crew. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he does it at, even though it, it is, it doesn't seem to be his nature, his idealistic nature. I support his decision. I would have done the same. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, well, I, I'm team to Paul on this one. To Paul in the very beginning mm-hmm. is like, you're not going to be able to save these people. You're going to have to destroy the transport. We have to make sure that nothing this gets is destroyed. nothing gets her more drenched than the idea of having to make that difficult call and use logic to back it up. I think nothing, she uh, loves it. She loves nothing more than when she realizes she would be a better commander than Archer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something, you know, I kind of agree with in some ways, <laughs> at least early on. Mm, maybe. Uh, but I do feel she's like. She's not going to pump those. not going to pump anyone's tires. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's not going to get her tires pumped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've discussed the difference in leadership style. Oh, she and, oh, she and T'Pol, boy. Oof. Yeah. And then uh, I, I actually like a lot of the crew 
you know, including Archer himself, because while you can see that this literally kind of pains him mm. to have to do these things, he does them because he knows he has to. And, and we have this kind of competence amongst the whole crew. Mm-hmm. You know, Reed is getting right at it. He's, you know, trying to uh, strengthen the phase pistols. Yep. You know, something with a punch. He's always carrying some kind of explosive device in a in a tact, small tactical nuke in a suitcase. Yeah, this guy's junk rat from <laughs> Overwatch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's always got explosives around him. And and I love that. It's, it's he's this guy, yeah, he's got a tactical nuke. Yes. In a suitcase, he's ready to go to a Broncos game and just <laughs> end it. <laughs> he's walk into the Mile High Stadium. He's like, I think there's a Borg in here. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> And so, yeah, we have uh, uh, a, a part, you know, this is one of those situations where there's not any kind of interior not uh, difficulties or whatever. Like everybody does their jobs mm. and it works great. And I like it. Do you want to listen to this stuff between Archer and Tabal? Yes. <sighs> Lieutenant Reed informed me that you plan to disable the transport when we find it. He thinks we can knock out the power systems without causing too much damage. So you still intend to rescue the humans? That's the general idea. If they've already been transformed, that could be difficult. I want to take these people home. The humans and the Tarkelians. No matter what state they're in. There are 29 life forms on that transport. It's logical to assume they've all been infected. We could endanger Enterprise if they're brought aboard. Perhaps you should reconsider. Are you saying we shouldn't go after that ship? I'm saying we destroy it. Blocks to Captain Archer. I'm getting real, real sick, Captain. <laughs> I'm getting real I don't woozy. feel so good. I'm getting real woozy. I'm getting real woozy. <laughs> Fucking Matthew Lillard. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I, I don't know. It's uh... <laughs> like you and Scoob. <laughs> Let's get out of here. I'm withdrawn from heroin real bad, Scoob. <laughs> I should have stabbed myself. It never works. <laughs> but no, uh, what do you think of this? I like it. I like that it's in private. Mm-hmm. She's not going to, you know, she's she's learned her lesson <laughs> about trying to curb stomp him in front of the crew. And, uh, and yet we still see this, you know, hopeless optimism, so to speak, mm-hmm. out of Archer. Is it me or does Fox <laughs> This, he, he dresses like he teaches fucking Tai Chi at I was the gonna local say like YMCA. Some kind of yoga that might involve sexual harassment is what I thought. <laughs> you fucking Tai Chi at the local Y. Yeah. 40 bucks a lesson. <laughs> mm-hmm. He actually, he taught Worf <laughs> how to do Tai Chi. Yeah, well. But, uh, so, I mean, I like that. I, I like that we have T'Pol ever the realist. And we, the we of course, yes, and we know so much more about the Borg than they do. Mm. And so, you know, Archer's optimism isn't unwarranted. Of course, because he doesn't know. Yeah, it is very indicative of his nature. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about him. Do we find him to be, do you think he is by kind of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as captains go? A little less jaded than maybe the likes of Cisco? Yes. Yeah. In in a way. Also, I think that makes sense with the novelty of... All his hatred goes towards the Vulcans anyway. (laughs) He doesn't yeah. have enough for the galaxy. It's all <laughs> yeah. for the Vulcans. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. Team Andorian. It's true. But mm-hmm. aren't we all? Uh, all the Vulcan calls. <laughs> he's like, hold those calls. Oh, yeah. The high Vulcan. Command. Fuck them. High Command's on the line. Uh, uh, high Command's on the line for you, Archer. Let them eat static. All right. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Fucking hates them. <laughs> Anyone else, though, picks it up right yeah. away. Yeah. Well, uh, literally. I mean, he's mm-hmm. desperate to uh, explore the galaxy. Yeah. Uh, and and he takes with him that kind of human optimism and idealism mm. that is really kind of counterbalanced by the dour Vulcan pragmatism. You could so, say that in the lying, <laughs> the copious <laughs> amounts of lying, in the in the just every they are like the father of lies. <laughs> <laughs> I now want like someone to do some artwork of Spock as Satan. That's beautiful. the father of lies. Well, he's got those pointy fucking eyebrows. That's yeah. a start. You and hell, give him the goatee, make him uh, mirror <laughs> Spock. Yep. But, uh, but yeah, I so, just want to ask, you think Leonard Amoy could be in Devil's Advocate? <laughs> be a lot less yelling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm the fucking devil, Bobby. <laughs> it's just great. Raw. Oh, 
I'm being told Leonard Nimoy's gonna hit. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. You gotta be fucking kidding me. The guy with a pointy ears. <laughs> what the fuck, Bobby? Can you make a phone call? <laughs> I really wanted this part. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I want to work with uh, John Wick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, have you seen Charlie Theron? She's got a great ass. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would probably be how it goes down in real life. Sounds about right. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you, uh, Al. But uh, I like how Flox is like, uh, well, if this doesn't work, I want you to just kill me with the gum <laughs> <Yeah>. jabar. <laughs> could you just, the nerd. Could it's going to shut me off like a switch. It's gonna, <laughs> yes, I'm not going to pass the Benny Gesserit test. I want you to just stick this in my neck and uh, death will come as swift as the headsman's axe. Yes. And, and there will that. definitely be nothing to regenerate. Nothing to regenerate. <laughs> yeah. Regenerating dead flesh. Flesh. But uh, anyway, Malcolm starts to, uh, basically, he's just kind of Kylo running it. More! Yeah. yeah. More! <laughs> That's what he's doing. More power, right? I think from what I've seen of Enterprise, Reed isn't given all that much to do. Him, like Mayweather and- Mayweather gets nothing to yeah. do. And even Hoshi doesn't get that much to do- beyond a certain point i mean yeah she gets involved in episodes quite a bit but and oh she more like snorri <laughs> yeah and so uh I, it's good to see reed doing i apologize what reed to does best anyone who got tuberculosis from that terrible joke that bomb <laughs> uh but yeah I like, that's what you got read for <laughs> i like yeah exactly uh sir uh what is the suitcase Ooh, the white light but no i like um <laughs> I like the uh, the look of the freighter. Yeah. It's fucking cool looking. And you know, you always know Borg has got it when it's got green lights, man. Once mm-hmm. those lights are green, it's Borgified. Yeah. And green and lots of tubes. Lots of tubes. Pipes. Shoot, aim for the tubes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally, just pull them out of his head. The fucker's dead. According to our reports, <laughs> you gotta go for the tubes. <laughs> look, if he's taking my role, I'm taking it. <laughs> I would have loved to see him in Star Trek. That'd have been. I can't funny. see anything in this fucking viewfinder, Bobby. <laughs> Why are we talking to Rob De Niro? Because he's my friend. <laughs> I like your concept of just an elderly Al Pacino ranting to a not there Bob De Niro. <laughs> Listen, I don't really like this role. It's kind of boring. Now, can you do Bob De Niro <laughs> talking to a non-existent Al Pacino? We'll bring it. We'll bring it full circle. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> it's the it's the fucking weird breathing Bobby does. Yeah. He's like, well, yeah. he does like that. It's weird. That's like weird. I don't know if that, that might not come through on the mic when I compress it. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. maybe you do. <laughs> yeah, you insult him a little bit, a little bit, Al. It's all the fucking breathing he does in the mic, the weirdo. I mean, Bobby, I'm fucking 70 years old. Why am I still a science officer? Uh. <clears throat> yeah, well, they, uh, they're they going to do a little boarding operation after our main man irradiates himself. Yep, yep. Does Phlox die of cancer in the early seasons? Because <laughs> the- he goes full fucking Chernobyl. Full Omicron full, particle or full whatever. Full K-19 Widowmaker, you know? <laughs> He's yeah. just in there like Harrison Ford. Getting beamed with nuclear energy. Full Leonard Nimoy at the end of mm-hmm. two. Yeah. Ship out of danger. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So the boarding operation is neat because you can see that a yeah, lot of cool. the ship. The conversion is, is cool. Yeah, exactly. A lot of the ship is still seems to be just, you know, Federation based, but they've got the, you know, the regeneration uh, nodes or whatever they're called uh, with Borg just resting in them. Yeah. And then uh, we see what happens when you piss them off. And mm-hmm. They're coming for you. They march down the hallway a little bit slower than they did before <laughs> on account of all the cybernetics. Yeah, exactly. And then you <laughs> shoot them and they die. Yeah. It's funny. Once, just like a lot of Starfleet tactical and uh, uh, Starfleet security, taking cover is not a class they take. <laughs> so they just march right forward. Borg are like, it's like when an adolescent girl first puts on the makeup, you're like, oof, it's a lot. It's a lot of makeup, honey. Like, it's, it's a lot. So it's kind of like new Borg. They're like, it's a lot of cybernetics. You probably don't need that many. It's going to slow oh, do you down. Don't mind them, Buffy. They're new Borg. <laughs> nice. Hey, nice Borg chicks. 
That's cool though. But I do like that little assault on the ship. Yeah. It's fucking sick. And I like, so they're, they're heading over there with no ability to escape necessarily because transporters, hopefully. The transporters. Yeah. Well, exactly. But right now they're trying to get the weapons back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Enterprise is having power trouble because of the, the Borg sabotage. Mm hmm. It's something of a, a trap almost. I mean, as soon as they pull out a warp to confront the transport, they get all fucked up. They get all fucked up. Yep. It's cool though. I like the green lighting. I like the uh, I like the phase pistol engagement and them. Our main man, fucking junk rat, the junk <laughs> yeah. rat of Star Trek. Yeah, I'm just sticking bombs everywhere. Just gonna put seven or eight right here, and uh, we should be good. This to guy's go. got more bombs than fucking Tommy Lee Jones does and blown away. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like you too? Do you like YouTube? YouTube. <laughs> anyway. I met Bono once. <laughs> a delightful lad. Yeah. He writes bad poetry sometimes. But they beam back over and uh, they blow this fucker up. Yeah. I like the Borger just like picking the bombs off. Like, mm -hmm. like but ticks. still just standing there. <laughs> and then just kaboom. Yep. And fortunately for the Enterprise, you know, the four or five Borg that are on their ship beam back right before they get destroyed, which is kind of silly. I don't think they do that. Mm -hmm. they wouldn't lose that advantage of convenient having... and then uh fucking archer goes ah torpedo fire <laughs> like fucking con and <laughs> yes. just blows this thing out of the sky and he does say hit it with everything we can yeah. and he wants that thing dead it's fucking cool very cool yeah and now uh, the doctor's back to work nathan yeah no worse for wear yep i probably can't have children anymore <laughs> i probably shouldn't have children <laughs> anymore That's anyway point. Yeah. yeah exactly uh, and then we get that line that you yeah. don't, you don't love. Should we have a listen to it? I think it's fine in con, you know, it just doesn't have to be. Yeah. yeah. Let's have a listen. Frequencies with geometric light in your measurements. Fancy Spatial Star Trek talk. They told their home world how to find Earth. Did you learn where the message was sent? Somewhere deep in the Delta Quadrant. Then I doubt there's any immediate danger. It would take at least 200 years for a substance no to reach the Delta Quadrant, assuming it's received at all. Sounds to me like we've only postponed the invasion until what? The 24th century. 2369 or 90? Yeah. Somewhere there. Yeah. 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 And so... I don't mind that in and of itself, but just with all of the other stuff, you know, it's a cumulative effect of just really trying to tie it in mm -hmm. rather than let it stand on its own. And that, that's my, com my one kind of complaint. I do feel like it stands alone on, it could stand alone much better with yeah. just a few more kind of explanations for why there wouldn't be any good records mm -hmm. of this event. You know, whether it's all of the research team's stuff has been destroyed, the ship is now destroyed and we didn't have necessarily as deep an engagement in sick bay as we're given something like that would mean yeah you could very possibly have no record of this that has anything easily linked to the board in the 24th century you know? right all right nathan let's mm -hmm. do a couple of listener comments <clears throat> andrew smith of the swamp circus podcast says fun fact as an homage to Quantum Leap, Archer's middle name happens to be Beckett, meaning if we're to follow TNG best of both worlds logic and Archer gets assimilated, he would go by designation Becutus. So while I love this episode, Enterprise missed golden opportunities for fun with Trip Southern dialect and regional disposition. How beautiful would it have been for Trip to interrupt the resistance is futile speech with a, I'm sorry, did you say your name was Big Cutie Ass? <laughs> Then spend the rest of the season imaginating him by calling him cute ass. We would have had an entire crew uh, sh shorting out Borg nanophobes and killing them by dumping Coors Light on their heads and beating them to death with whoop ass sticks. Absolutely, like I said. Then when they adapt the that they adapt, he could yell, "Switch brands!" Some crew member grabs the last case of PBR. Trip slaps him in the face. I'm saving that for more pleasant types of company, if you don't mind. There you go. Good stuff out of Andy, as usual. We also have a couple of comments on Discord. If you want to participate in the commentary, visit us on uh, the Kirking Off group on Facebook. You'll find it if you search it. 
And uh, I think we got links in the show notes as well as libertygeek.net slash discord. We have a channel dedicated to the Trek pod as it's called. Um, just easier to find that way. So let's yeah. talk about Bry cops comment. Cause I think he kind of nails a lot of what we're saying. here. Mm. You want to do this? Or you want me to do it? Uh, you can do it. The Borg doesn't belong in the enterprise franchise. For one, I would say it undercuts Q who, but fucking whatever. Sequel shouldn't ruin established material. Mostly just overtly canonical, canonically ridiculous. The kind of would have been well documented and high profile, particularly because it wasn't some strange one-off encounter with no evidence. Um, lots of parenthetical here. Reference the great <laughs> yeah, Enterprise episode for each encounter with a Frankie that explains how they remain largely anonymous. Mm-hmm. They were on Earth, probably left evidence because it's not like the Borg about covering up. Presumably the sensor data from the Enterprise itself would be equivalent to uh, the info collected by the Enterprise D hundreds of years later. Yeah. It continues. Enterprise is a legitimately good show. I think shit like this was its biggest weakness. A lot of people also love the Mirror episodes, which I believe took the same relative misstep. Prequel material to establish later storylines need to be handled carefully to not interfere or more likely just kind of be shitty fan service. <laughs> Enterprise works so much better when they rely on their own unique story. It's not to say they haven't had success with handling things to come, but there is a subtle difference between what works and what doesn't. Malcolm is really going to figure out how to remodulate phase specials to get multiple shots on him, and Flox is going to develop a treatment for the inner probes, but none of it's in the Starfleet database. Okay, guys. <laughs> they just overreach a little, I think. I understand the pull toward bringing them back as a popular villain, but I don't know they, I don't know they belong in this any more than they would in DS9. Voyager was the perfect venue for Borg action. Regardless of how one feels about how that went, it made perfect sense. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing you guys think, and fuck you for first contact. <laughs> if you ever treat undiscovered country that way, I'm writing a strongly worded letter to your mothers about civility. There you go. Yes. Well, I was going to say, now I did have one thing that I had remembered uh, seeing, and uh, it was Lacutus Le- is actually not like, uh, it's not a nonsense word or anything like that. It's Latin, yeah. Latin for locution, the, the one who speaks, yeah. which comes to because he is the mouthpiece of yeah. the board. So, yeah, That's sense. where they got Lacutus from. Absolutely. Not yeah. from Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, but, uh, I, uh, I like... Yeah, locution makes sense. Yes, yeah, exactly. The root of that. And uh, I like the, the idea that, you know, you can have too much fan service. Mm-hmm. But with Enterprise, I think, one, they were a little bit desperate at that I point think so. to get the ratings up. So I kind of cut them a break. Okay. They're trying to save the ship. So to speak. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, bringing the Borg back for just one episode, I think is, is okay. And actually I would have stomached a two part, you know, could have easily been done for sure. So, so you don't mind the premise. It's the yeah. execution that might be the problem. And I think that's a lot of Brian's yeah. main point. Well, and, or just like the, the little details, mm-hmm. because if you're trying to fit it into larger canon, the best you can, you have to do a very good job. Yes. That is a tall order. Yep. And, uh, and in, in did they succeed 100%? No. But it's still an entertaining episode. <laughs> but it's still an entertaining episode. Yeah, this is one of it those episodes. It brings the Borg back to a force that is kind of fearful, which is something I kind of think they lost as they Along went through the Voyager. Mm. Voyager was always teaming up with them in various episodes. And perhaps most importantly, they're a small, uh, intrepid class ship that has that defeated them countless mm. times <laughs> yeah, in, it becomes, in the Delta Quadrant. This is it, no longer fearful. Doesn't it become difficult? In any TV series where you have a recurring villain that happens over and over again, that how do you maintain the interest in that villain? Yeah. Right? How do you keep them interesting? I, I don't know the answer with the Borg, because I think the Borg represented something. I think they I think they're a good metaphor for things we've discussed yes. on many episodes before. But I think ultimately it 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 maybe maybe I'm wrong about this because I don't really know the answer to it, but it it you have to let that evolve in some way. And that's something I think, you know, I, I rail on The Walking Dead all the time, which to be clear, I haven't watched in season eight. I think that's when we bailed on the podcast too. But one thing that happens in that show is the bo- is that the, the zombies become more of an obstacle than mm-hmm. a true terror. Because yeah. over time you figure out how to deal with them. Yeah. So I don't know what happens with the Voyager episodes, but it, but m- maybe that's what happens. I don't know. I don't know if they just become like, oh, the Borg, that's fine. We don't have fucking... Something like it, yeah. And that's what's weird about the Borg, because, I don't know, like, 
the Borg seem because the Borg are a computer game. It seems like once you defeat the Borg, you kind of defeat the Borg in perpetuity. Versus <laughs> yeah. like the the Klingons, which yeah. will do something different tactically. Yeah, this is true. The Borg seem like the the Borg is one of those enemies that once you figure out how to defeat, you think it would just that'd be the end of them. Yeah, forever because <laughs> they failed as a program. Yeah, you know. Versus the Klingons were like, well, there's emotion behind it. There's something different about. It. Yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. and ironically enough, perhaps. A greater adaptability, sure. Because that's one thing, like, or a, th- or a willingness to yeah. take two steps back to go forward, which yeah. a computer doesn't do. No, it just and, knows how to go circumvent. And the Borg's apparent kind of lack of tactics. You would think in their adaptability, in their you know taking over all of these cultures and all of these species, they would have learned tactics. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that for a minute, because because this this is going to come up when we talk Terminator Two, and we've been talking Terminator a lot because of the mm-hmm. way uh, the the Terminator operates. There's this great scene in in uh, Terminator Two where the Terminator, the Arnold Terminator, yeah. the T eight hundred, he's going to rescue Sarah Connor. I've mentioned this multiple times before in the past, but it bears repeating. And there's a guard house. Yeah, and there's a there's a guard house with a window. So imagine that the guardhouse, imagine that, that you're, that you could reach out, that you, you could stick your hand, you could just take your left hand and reach out laterally and touch the window. And then a little forward of that is the door to go into the guardhouse. Arnold wants to open the gate. He's a machine. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line typically. So he looks and he punches directly through the glass and he grabs the thing and he opens the gate versus walking a few steps down and yep. entering the guardhouse and opening the thing. And what I like about that is a couple of things. That's, that's machine tactics. Yeah. Like, so, so the Borg might not have tactics per se, but it might be more apt to say they don't know how to really like improvise tactics. Mm-hmm. Their tactic is direct. Yeah. So the, the Terminator in this case, he might have, that might've been a bad tactic if he needed to not leave evidence of his passing. Yeah. But it, but he doesn't care about no. that. That's not his directive. His directive is to do this thing immediately. And I think yeah. that's where the Borg might run into trouble. They don't know enough to go backwards to go forwards. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the Terminator too, it's a question of efficiency. There's no 100%. cost punching through the window. A hundred percent. And you say- Seemingly. Yeah. You save a couple of seconds. I mean, because he knows his fist is just going to shatter the glass. And right. He can turn the thing. He's not going to get cut up like a human would. Right. But he can't, he doesn't seem to be able to evaluate, oh, that made noise and alerted this yeah. other thing. That's yeah. not his concern. Right. A human might look around and consider that. Well, and even the good guy Terminator 2 is in a stage where he has his mission. And if you're getting in the way of that, he's just going to kill you. He's going to walk through you. Yeah. And I think that's what the Borg do. Yeah, and, and until, you know, uh, John Connor is telling him not to kill people. Mm-hmm. That's what gets him into, you know, the guards or whatever, you know. <laughs> you know the, of live. course, I'm the a Terminator. Terminator. He'll live. Yeah. You know, he shoot he shoots him in the legs out. Yeah. He might. Yeah. <laughs> he also might but, bleed out and die. I'm glad we're talking about this yeah. Terminator scene now because it comes back to the woman using deception in that moment. Yeah. It's not Borg-like. Yeah. You know, it's it's... In other words, if that's the Terminator, he doesn't. He doesn't care. He sits up and grabs you. He doesn't wait a second. He doesn't delay. I actually almost think that might have been better cinematographically. Cinema what? Cinematographically. I like that. Cinematography. Yeah. It just to have her just like sit up, almost Frankenstein like, behind <laughs> fucking the guard, and just Mike Myers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Hell, <laughs> throw a sheet over, and it'll be like you know the episode of Next Gen with all the yeah. the bodies sitting up. Oh, poor Beverly. Yeah. Well. But so having uh, that argument that perhaps the Borg are doing it for efficiency, you know, avoiding, because tactics have a probability attached, you know, like, is this going to succeed? Is this not? It's a pros and cons. Yeah. And so I would, and and costs and, and, and such to balance. 100%. And so I would think that they'd be very good at that. Right. Uh, But assuming anything unpredictable doesn't happen. Yeah. Whereas. Which they could calculate lots of variables. Yeah. But like, so whenever an Enterprise away team beams over to your Borg ship, it's a zero cost exercise to have the drone closest to them wake up and hit them with the assimilation tools. Right. Uh, and it's also the most efficient thing to do. Mm-hmm. It negates the threat, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not something that they seem capable of doing. Right. And I don't know why that would be. Hmm. And it does prevent them from being truly, truly terrified because they appear to have 
for want of a better word, they appear to have a Borg culture that says, ah, you can beam over to our ship and that's mm-hmm. going to be, it's going to, it's going to be fine. Resistance is futile. <laughs> that's the culture. Except clearly not. Clearly not. When you have plot armor. <laughs> <laughs> plot armor that's immune, that's immune to no matter how much you fucking modulate the phasers. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Our cutting beams can't get through the plot armor. <laughs> We're venting writers into space. <laughs> well, you Good. know. <laughs> current check, vent all the writers into space. <laughs> um, yeah, man, it's it's interesting to think about Borgs tactically. They have a they have a they have a directive which they execute. And if yeah. they couldn't execute it, then they would think of a different way to execute it. Is that tactics? Kind of? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. But I almost feel like the only... the, the only, on the fly tactics, sorry yeah. to interrupt. That's the, I think improvisation is what machines struggle with. Like, if I sit down to play chess with Data, he's going to beat me every time. Yeah. Or, you know, what if I take my beer bottle and I whip it at the wall behind him and he turns around and he looks and I cheat? Like, how does he compensate for that? He yeah. might, he, he, he might know, oh, well, you cheated. And I'll be like, well, I'll show me. How can you prove it? He just knows, like, you know, could you get in Data's head? I don't know. Could you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the Borg, you, Borg Queen tried. <laughs> well, it's funny because I think about, like, think of a game like poker. How good would Data be at poker? And then we, and I know he comes up a lot. Mm-hmm. Bluffing. He's trying to determine if somebody's bluffing. It's interesting because at what point does the math, because, because poker, I think, is a great example. Because with poker, there's a finite amount of cards. You know some of the cards, which means you can then make some calculations based on that, but only on that, because then you have the other cards. Mm -hmm. So now you're going, okay, this person's behavior is tipping me off as to what they possibly could have. And then you have to make a decision based on that. And then there is the random chance or luck, if you want to call it, generator of what's his fucking pocket pair? What's in his pocket? Does he have a pair? Does he have fucking... Two aces, does he have, like, what? what's in there? I don't really know. Yeah. Oh, I see three aces on the flop. I know he only could only potentially have one, but since I have one, I know he doesn't. Yeah. So, you know, like, that's, so it must be weird for Data. Well, at I that think, point, Data goes, I have four aces, I win. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. He has what is called the nuts, <laughs> yeah. as it were. Nothing can beat that. Yeah. But, um, but no, yeah, it becomes very interesting because it's not like chess. No. Where there is calculations that the computer can, like, as we know, the computer wins every time now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, they I used, think they have a really good record. Yeah, it's really high. Maybe they occasionally lose, but... Right. But still. But yeah, and data playing poker is a great example, and I like that they use that because it is a uniquely kind of human game. It's the only game I could think that the other crew members of the Enterprise could win mm. against data, potentially. Sure, because of the because, uh, because of the, the variable. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's funny because I think about tactics. Like you think about just Terminator. You would you you a part of you has to know that the machines are predictable. Yeah. Because they're always going to take the the highest probability of success route that they can based on the equipment they have. So, it, I, that's the only advantage you really have is yeah. deception or feints yeah. or trickery or something they can't really come up with. But know that if it happens, they can start to calculate, like, how do we get out of this rather quickly? Yeah. You know, it's, they have so many fucking tools. It's yeah. interesting. Because they're, they're all uh, surgically attached to their arms. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Fucking whirly gigs and fucking <laughs> yeah. gizmos and shit. I, I know. And I do almost wish that they had made the, uh, the arms look more useful. <laughs> No, no. They just look so fucking useless. They look like, completely useless. It's a club that just has little metal bits that twirl and whirl and poke. <laughs> and it's a club with a tiny little fan for those humid days. <laughs> with a little drill. It's powerful good out hot. <laughs> it's powerful hot out here, sir. I'm glad you got a propeller on your arm. It gets so hot down in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> it gets so hot thing? on a board cube. <laughs> no, Who sh- needs a tidy fan? It's a hundred and what? Two? two yep. Oh, fuck. God damn it. <laughs> That's it. You know, you turn the heat up to 102 at my house, you get beat down. <laughs> yeah, powerful good heart. I wish I had a nice cold lemonade. <laughs> or <a> sweet tea. <laughs> fuck. Let's read JDI, bay. Mm, all right. I thought it was I go. No, it's I bay. And uh, I did like, I, I like his comment a lot too. Do it. Re- regarding regeneration. I like this episode as a standalone, but did we really need it? Are we out of ideas? Is where uh, is where further reflection fades away the 
Ooh, it's like the thing, but it's the Borg. Fluttering geekery. <laughs> a standout moment for me is Archer's moment to take action to finish the conflict by destroying the infected ship after realizing there is no one to save. Mm. I appreciate the struggle in back of this performance. That's the point I was making as well. Uh, my only question to open for a discussion, how well would this episode be received if we just didn't know anything about That's kind of what I was talking about. Yeah, if this was just a thing alien, sorry, I can't avoid the obvious comparison, uh, encounter with the prior knowledge of the collective and events from first con- without the prior knowledge mm-hmm. of uh, the collective and events of first contact i enjoyed the element on the characters uh, discovering and unveiling this pandora's box of mystery knowing about the borg and how they operate created great tension in the story mm. but i also rolled my eyes with the explanations and tie-in as badly inserted fan service really didn't need it all charted out for me and worst yeah. of all recovering from the borg simulation is easy thanks five minutes of screen time <laughs> It took four episodes and a whole TNG movie for Picard to kind of get over it. Anyway, I still entertained by the episode, just kind of didn't need it as additional board encounter in the Star Trek time. I'm going to sedate him. <laughs> <laughs> and then put myself in the microwave oven. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> Which Medium I power. would have been so much more effective if it was a, it was a random red shirt. And Bacula had to press the button to cook him and get rid of the nanites? Oh, fuck. Do you have a problem if I put the popcorn in there with you? <laughs> oh, no, no. That's fine. Do you mind if I have some? Well, I'm being treated for Borg. <laughs> Go for it. Pop, 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 pop. But yeah, no. So uh, <laughs> I will say, like, obviously his assimilation wasn't as complete as, you know, Picard's mm. or anything. So well, speaking of, so it's interesting. Picard, we see, has a stump when they're installing his Borg arm. In best of both worlds, they've removed part of his arm. No, I thought he just made a weird fist. <laughs> oh, did he? I thought it was. No, an he actual... makes like a weird fist, and he goes. Mm. I thought I thought it was like a no, like an remember, actual stump. I remember making fun of it. I was yeah, like, it, it, looks it looks ridiculous, super no matter what. Ludicrous. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. yeah. So I, I was wondering if he, you know now he's all robot. Thanks, Picard season one <laughs> or whatever. But. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the the reality is, of course, we didn't need this Borg episode. Mm. But I do feel like, one, it's enjoyable. And two, it was kind of a shot in the arm to the Enterprise uh, franchise. You know, the Enterprise different seasons definitely brought back, you know, uh, I think some interest. And then this is the very end of season two, which we then see, you know, most people say season three and four are, mm. the, are the best. That's cool. So it, it might be that this is kind of the inflection point where it starts to get better. Yeah, it's possible. All right, we're going to pull up best of both worlds real yeah, quick and see if he does the old see. stump race. Is it in the second episode? I don't recall. It might be the very beginning of the second. You know, they show the drill coming at his eye and everything or whatever as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, because the because Locutus is discovered and then they go back and show us a bit. I think you're right first episode of season four incorrect strategy number one you should have just sedated us (laughs) (laughs) well they do Mm, more or less that's almost a (laughs) tie-in sleep tarkalian sleep he's exhausted yes counselor (laughs) or yes doctor however um it's cool that i have to pay that i have what is this strange new worlds about that we see an ad for right now it's the tales of christopher pike Aha. Interesting. I have no faith it'll be good, but it could be. You never know. Yeah. It is back to uh, an episodic spacefaring enterprise. No so, kidding. Yeah. So it has potential. Okay. I like uh, Captain Pike, the a- actor. Uh, number one, his first officer is Rebecca Romaine Stamos. Come on. Yep. Mm. And, How old is she these days? Uh, and their Spock is acceptable. I don't know. Is oh, the they have a name. Spock. Yeah, it's not Zach Quinto. No, how many yeah. fucking people are going to play Spock? <laughs> I, this guy's not terrible. <laughs> I, I I only know from very brief clips of Discovery. Yeah, but because uh, right. he also was in season two. Of let's Discovery. let's see if he does all fucking crooked hands. <laughs> yeah, There's... have they given him his? Not yet. His can opener yet? <laughs> Didn't need more data. <laughs> oh yeah. no, you were right. He's doing a weird yeah. fucking like. He's doing. <laughs> Let's rewind it. I might be thinking of a different. I might be thinking of a scene in First Contact where someone has a stuff. Probably he does like a fucking. Yeah. He does like a, a fucking claw. tiger claw, <laughs> fucking kung fu tiger claw fist. <laughs> that explains it. Yeah. 
Now, what do Whirling. any of these contraptions what do? What is all of that? <laughs> like this here is a right angle screwdriver. <laughs> this here is an electric can opener. No, no, those would be useful things. Dude. That's we a good can, point. <laughs> can't have useful things. <laughs> oh fuck, dude, that's funny. Yeah. Well, what are we doing next on Kirk and Off, man? Uh, well, we are going to do a Voyager episode. Are we doing Scorpion? I think so. I think that's the one to do. Yeah, because that was one of the comments on Discord. Yep. Was, um, I believe it was from a gentleman named Lothalin. Mm-hmm. He's been listening. Uh, he actually said the Borg are simply adding biological signatures to their own. What that means exactly, anyone guess. You should check out these episodes. He was wondering uh, why we keep asking the question of why uh, the... I've been listening to the Borg episodes, and it seems like you guys keep asking the why of the Borg, right? Mm-hmm. And he's saying the Borg are simply adding a biological technology to their own and pursuit of perfection. I think that's what we're questioning more yeah. than we know what they say. We're questioning if they're executing that in a way that makes sense with sense. what they say if they're yeah. fucking computers. Yeah. More yeah. than that. Exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, the quest for perfection, how are you not going to be more perfect than a machine designed mm-hmm. For perfection. And he admits you know? that's anyone's guess. And yeah. that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're guessing. And uh, my favorite part of that is, I mean, just, I mean, every day is the same anyway. So <laughs> even Over as a Borg, especially as a Borg. I Fucking mean, Stanley Cooper. Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> makes, Again. Makes you just want to point your can opener at your head and end it all, <laughs> man. Pull out the wires at the back. <laughs> Spill your own fucking dinty more on the floor. So he was saying Omega Directive or Scorpion. Yep. Uh, Scorpion is the introduction of seven or nine. That's also kind of why I was leaning two parter. He yeah. says um, the Omega Directive, and in particular the two parter Scorpion. Yeah. These two you, stories uh, give quite a bit of information on how the Borg think and operate. And if I'm not mistaken, the Omega Directive occurs after Scorpion. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I was leaning towards Scorpion. Okay, let's do it. You want to do a two parter named Scorpion? Yes. Fucking biggest bo- biggest block of all time. This Borg block is yep. massive. And it comes to an end. Yeah. I like going, yeah. All right, cool. Well, I'm looking forward to What do you to want to do after the Borg? That's the real question. I don't know. Maybe the listeners can go to LibertyGeek.net Liberty slash Discord <clears throat> or find Kirking Off on Facebook groups and give us some suggestions and uh, we'll think of something in the meantime. Yes. And my one, uh, you know, if you're thinking of themes and everything, my one comment will be, please come up with something that lets us watch some original series. Mm. We haven't done that in some time. Because obviously, they didn't have any Borg. So. Yeah, we can get away from the Borg for a stretch. Mm-hmm. We're all fucking Borg down. Mm. 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 Anyway. So, no. Um, what was I going to say? Um, this is a lot of fun. It's been a while. <clears throat> so, yeah, we, we, we say we're going to record every other week. Like That's kind of what we're trying to mm-hmm. promise. But we might be trying to come back at this with a little more frequency. Yeah. Let's see about that. I'm definitely down. Cool. Right on. Well, I think that's all we got for now, boys and girls. Um, we thank you very much for your time. Yes, indeed. Um, for your continued listening. Make sure you uh, share these episodes with your friends and family. Yeah. Get them to listen. That would be cool. And uh, make sure you participate. We appreciate these listener comments. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to hear from you guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got a pretty cool uh, community of people. So, yeah. We do. We yeah, do. There you have it. Nathan, yeah. it's been a pleasure, my good man. Um, I think that's all we have for today. I think we're going to get out of here. Time for us to enter our regeneration nodes. You've been listening to Kirking Off, a warped Star Trek shakedown from LSG Media. Don't forget to visit us online at libertystreetgeek.net. That's libertystreetgeek.net. Hey, everybody, this is Dean just breaking to the end here to say thank you to Floyd Fry for providing the lovely dulcet tones that you hear on the intro and outro of this particular podcast episode. He can be found on the Poplist podcast, as well as Scranton Talk, a generational The Office podcasts. And of course, I must thank the inimitable Scofflaws who were gracious enough to let us use this great piece of music that we had to have for Kirking Off called William Shatner. Make sure you guys pop over and check out what they have going on. And of course, thanks to all of the listeners who have been listening, subscribing, and sharing, and all of that jazz. You guys make this whole thing possible. I, uh, I put you all up for promotion. You're the best. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.